The good news is we've come a long way from that first interaction I had with my first patient with ALS where my attending said, we have no idea what causes this. You know, now, now we know that there are genetic causes of ALS. We've got at least 25 different genes that do different things where mutations can actually lead to ALS. Together, those comprise about 10% of all the cases of ALS that we see. The other 90%, the kind we call sporadic ALS, we don't know for sure, but we have some theories. So uh, there's two theories that I think are, are, are sort of the most developed and most exciting. One of these is the theory of the toxin beta-methylaminoalanine, also called BMAA. And this theory actually first started on the island of Guam, where once upon a time the risk of ALS was 50 times what it is anywhere else in the world. And so people flock there to try to understand what is happening to the people who live on this island, the native population called Chamorros. And when these people died and they were autopsied, their brains and spinal cords were full of this toxin. And so they scoured the island to figure out where was this coming from. And the first two places they found it were in these seeds called cycads that the native people ate. And the other place they found it were in these flying squirrels. And so with education and the gradual extinction of those flying squirrels, the risk of ALS on Guam did drop, but it still hasn't normalized. And that led them to find a third source of this toxin, which is called cyanobacter, also known as blue-green algae. And, and that was fascin fascinating. I was at the meeting where that research was presented and you could almost hear a pin drop because now we, re we realized for the first time this toxin might be relevant outside of Guam. You know, cyanobacter, blue-green algae is everywhere. And so people came home from that meeting and they did autopsy studies on people who had never been to Guam, people from North America. And sure enough, in a very small subset, they did find this toxin in the brains and spinal cords. And then they did epidemiology studies looking at the risk of ALS around bodies of water you know, that contain blue-green algae. And sure enough, they found it to be elevated. And so what's really exciting is we actually understand how this toxin might produce disease. It gets incorporated into proteins in place of the amino acid called serine. And so we now have some clinical trials underway of high-dose serine suppl supplementation to try to block this toxic cause of ALS. And the first of those trials was published a few years ago. It was a very small trial, just 20 people with ALS, mainly designed to see how much of this supplement, serine, can people tolerate. Turns out they can tolerate a lot, up to 15,000 milligrams twice a day. And it turns out at those higher dosages, it did look like there was some slowing of ALS progression. And so the trial that's underway now is of that dose, 15,000 milligrams twice a day. And it's a much larger trial to really get a definitive idea of whether this can slow ALS progression. The other theory of sporadic ALS is that there might be a, a virus, a virus called HERV-K, human endogenous retrovirus K, that causes some, some cases of sporadic ALS. And the evidence for this comes mainly from a doctor at the NIH named Dr. Nath. And he's been able to show that he can find this virus in the blood of some people with sporadic ALS, and he doesn't find it in healthy people. And when he puts this virus genetically into mice, they get an ALS-like disease. And so he's got a really cool trial underway. If you get into the trial, the first thing he does is a blood test to see if you have this virus in your blood. If you don't, you're out of the study. If you do, you get treated with antiretroviral therapy, the kind of thing that we use to treat people with HIV. So I think that's going to be fascinating to see how that turns out.